Hear NFL legends, players, coaches, and media members from around the country sharing their insights and stories with us year-round. Here on Thursday night, tailgate, 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 tail, 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 tailgate. And now joining us on Thursday night, tailgate is former Bucks linebacker Chris Washington. Let me give you some background on Chris. He is from Jackson, Mississippi. Played his college ball at Iowa State, where he was a four-year letterman. In 1981, he was awarded the Dury Moss Award for being the most outstanding newcomer. In 82, he won the school's Alfred Ullman Award for being the junior who displayed leadership and academic excellence. 83, he was recognized as the team's most outstanding defensive player. He set the school record for most tackles in a season with 168 and in a career with 457. Led the team in tackles three straight seasons from 1981 to 1983. He was inducted into the Cyclones Hall of Fame in 2009. He was a six-round draft pick in 1984 by the Tampa Bay Bucks, and he played in the league from 84 to 1990 with the Bucks, 49ers, and Cardinals. And we're excited to have him with us tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Chris, Chris and Bob here. Thanks for coming on the show. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. How's everything going? Ah, very good. Thank you, Chris. So, Chris, I want to start off by going back to your time at Iowa State. Prior to you mm-hmm. getting there, I was looking back at the at the rivalry between Iowa and Iowa State. It was pretty one-sided. Yeah. Iowa had won 18 of the previous 24 meetings, 8 of the last 10. But you helped Iowa State win three in a row from 80 to 82. What do you remember about being a part of that big rivalry? Uh, the coach, the coach I had, uh, uh, Coach Corey, he was our defensive coordinator and he was a linebacker coach at that time. He was just very thorough and, uh, we had, we happened to have a good group of players at that time and, uh, everyone just, everyone did their job. We played, we played well against them and if we didn't win any other game, if we lost every other game, that's fine as long as we beat Iowa. That was our motto. Five questions for Chris? Chris, I want to talk about your uh, your in, introduction to the NFL in '84. That that first very first training camp, John McKay, the coach. I didn't realize Wayne Fonts was the defensive coordinator. Yeah. Take me back to those yeah. memories uh, when you first arrived there, and uh, what that first training camp was like. Well, well, the first camp, I realized right away after the first couple of days that the head coach was not really. He wasn't. He wasn't really involved in the, all everything that was going on. He gave it to uh, his assistant coaches to run. He wasn't. He just wasn't too involved in what was going on. And as I said, no one, no one took us, no one took us seriously. So it was hard to keep uh, keep the spirits up with the team. Um, but we had, you know, we had good young players. Uh, Hugh Green. I got a chance to play with Hugh Green and uh, Leroy Selman. You know, uh, so I learned from I learned from a lot of guys, and it was um, I don't know just the youth of the team. We just didn't have I don't know. We just weren't consistent enough. You know, that's the main thing in the NFL being consistent, and we didn't have that at that time. But as you see, that has turned around as well. But it was it was a great place to live, and um, uh, had a good time trying to. Uh, get the organization to uh, be a little more successful, but it didn't happen at that time, but it, it, it did happen later on. So, And I wanted to ask you more about Leroy Selman, Chris, uh, the member of the Selman brothers family there. They were all very talented, but this guy, of course, uh, played his whole career in Tampa Bay, uh, was out of football by the time he was 30, but had done enough to earn Hall of Fame status. Tell us more about this guy, what type of player, and what type of te- what kind of teammate he was. Leroy was a great leader. He, he didn't, uh, you know, he wasn't trying to intimidate anyone. He was the quietest guy. You wouldn't even know he would be there, but when, the, when, we, put on the, when we put on our uniforms and went on the field on Sundays, he was a totally different person. And um, he was always trying to uh, build, you know, he was always trying to help the younger guys uh, get become comfortable with what we're doing. Um, he was a great leader uh, in the community as well as uh, with the team. Um, and um, we just we just we just didn't have the consistency that we needed to be successful at that time. But he was loved in the neighborhoods uh, throughout the league. 
he was well respected, a uh, great pass rusher, and uh, uh, I, I just learned a lot just watching him go through his drills and go through his assignments each day during the game practice. Uh, I was lucky to have a chance to play with him. And expand on a little bit of that, Chris. Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh, and I grew up a huge Hugh Green fan. And uh, yeah. curious, just to you know, you mentioned him a moment ago. Curious to get your memories of playing alongside of Hugh. Uh, he was a he was a he was a, he was a madman, but but it was controllable madness. And just watching him, uh, just watching his technique on the field, um, I, I learned a lot just watching him in the films every week. And then, unfortunately, in the, the fourth week, I think it was yeah, I think it was the fourth week of my rookie year. We were leaving practice, and Hugh Green had just bought a brand new Corvette. And he was driving. He was going over an overpass. He hit something, and his car went airborne. His car went airborne, and he went over into the ditch. So, I got out of the car along with other players that were behind on the highway. We go down, you know, we walk over to the car. We ran to the car. We get to the car. And he has a pole going through his leg that went through his leg. I'm telling you, Hugh Green looked up at me. He he laughed for a second. He said, he said okay, rookie, it looks like you're about to get your chance to go play. And and, and then he he passed out, and then they took him to the hospital and went from there. Um, he had a great attitude. Uh, he, is, uh, he was a madman on the field, though. So he was a great teacher as well. Chris, you get traded to the 49ers. In 1989, the team would would go on to win the Super Bowl that year. But I read you, that uh, you missed that year because you, you had a broken ankle during preseason. Did you get an opportunity to play at all that year with the 49ers? No, and the, I played uh, up until that last preseason game before before my before my own teammate, a form, uh, Bubba Paris, uh, decided to lay his shoulder on my on my ankle and snapped it in the drill we were doing in practice. Uh, um, after yeah, ap- after that, um, I, did, I wasn't able to, I was, I was cleared for the Super Bowl, but I didn't dress for the Super Bowl. So it was a very, it was a rewarding and disappointing season at the same time. No, I didn't, I didn't get to play. Uh, I was in practices doing drills and all that, but I wasn't, wasn't clear to play. So, uh, and it was, it was probably a good thing. You know, I went ahead and played another year, another year in, uh, in Arizona. But uh, that's, things happen. So I was happy to be right. there and, uh, you know, learned a lot from a lot of guys and uh, just went on from there. And, Chris, I, I heard that you do karate, and it helped focus your mind for football. Talk about that. Well, I, I, my cousins and uh, my, most of my family on my mother's side lived in Chicago, and we um, probably when I was in, it was my junior year, junior year of high school, right about the time I started playing football, uh, we got involved in mars- in the martial arts, uh, Aikido, Tangsudo, to be specific to the type of art it was, um, and I needed that because I grew up in Chicago on the South Side at that time, and I wasn't a very confident kid I was an only child and I was always trying to protect my mother so uh, you know there was a lot of crap I took because of that but then as time went on taking the martial arts it gave me confidence Uh, my flexibility saved me from many other injuries that I could have had I mean I had 23 surgeries over my career and but it would probably been a lot more than that well I wouldn't have made it to that point if I didn't have the flexibility and the confidence that it gave me because I knew at that point I could beat the crap out of somebody, but I don't have to to prove that to anyone. That was a mentality I developed, and it helped me when I got on the field with football. I never played football before in my life. I played basketball. I was going, I was going to be a pro basket, professional basketball player, but I ended up uh, playing football after being called, uh, after it was suggested by one of our coaches, our head coach J. W. Smith. Um, every day he would, every day he would bring the football bring the pads and sit them at the end of the court. Every He did it every day for months. And then I finally came out and I started playing. And it was the best decision I ever made because it, it taught me a lot. It helped me communicate, start to communicate because I'm a quiet guy. Uh, so it helped, helped me quite a bit. 
and uh, it was the best decision I ever made. I loved it. Of course, uh, we had mentioned earlier in the show uh, about you uh, being uh, recognized for your academic excellence in the past also. And I'm sure there's probably times, Chris, over your career and, and even at this point where you're able to reach out to young kids and talk to them about education, uh, tell us what you would tell these people. I'll tell you what I do tell them. Uh, I get them, if I can get a, uh, get a student to believe in himself, and that's, that's more than half the battle right there, but just getting them to believe they can accomplish anything. And with the technology and everything that started coming about as we got older and my generation, that was the rea- that was the reality of it. You could do anything, and I have formed a Youth Inspiration Goal Foundation program that worked with uh, that worked with students on on uh, goal setting, self esteem, and just getting them to believe in themselves. Uh, and I, I found that that was something I enjoyed doing. I loved doing that. I worked in um, in the Bay Area at several different high schools uh, doing that. And it was the best thing I could have ever done because when I was retired from the NFL, I was I was sort of depressed. I was very very angry at everything and everyone because I I just was. I just had that mentality. Working with the working with the high school students was medicine for me. It helped me to heal as well as to give back to the community. So I loved it, and I still do it here and there. Not as much as I did before, uh, but it, it taught it taught me a lot. And um, I work with a lot of students, and I loved every minute of it. And that was my follow-up, Chris, how tough it was to be out of the NFL before you even hit 30. It's something you were doing for a long time, and all of a sudden the uh, the transition is always tough for many guys we've talked to, and, and uh, I guess you've hinted it was very tough for yourself. Well, it was tough because I didn't prepare myself. You know, you're that cocky football player. You think, oh, I can do anything. I don't need to. I can put it off. I'm, you know, it's never going to end until it does. And then you're not prepared for that. And I was lucky enough to have a former player, Michael Green. He played with he played with the, the Green Bay Packers. I met him with the alumni chapter in San Diego and or in the Bay Area. And he put, took me to the side and said, have you ever have he said have you talked to them about the benefits? Do you know about the benefits you have? I thought about going back to school, and he just he was in my ear all the time, and he was one of the one of the people that helped me get my crap together. I went back to school. I went back to school and got my bachelor's and uh, got my bachelor's and then I got my uh, master's in psychology, and I was working on my doctorate on uh, my doctorate in. Uh, in, uh, in the Bay in San Diego, so I finally got myself back on track and realized that it's never too late to finish to finish uh, uh, your education because it's it's definitely going to be around much longer than your uh, abilities to play professional sports well. So, and Chris, a couple more before we let you go, and and you mentioned the struggles to to give away tickets. To, to those Bucks yes. uh, games back in the early part of the 80s. You were there from 84 to 88, five seasons over that time. The yes. team won 19 games. You went through three head coaches. You know, just talk, yes. what was it like? I mean, it, it, was it a, a losing culture kind of situation? Was it a talent issue? Or the, was it an issue with the coaches just not being able to reach the players? What, what happened that the Bucks just couldn't get it together during that period of time? <sighs> I think it was just it was just a combination of not we had that we had talented players we had you know we had like I said uh, Hugh Green, Lewis Selman, uh, John, James Wilder we had you know several players but we just for some reason we couldn't take it from the practice field to the playing field at that time um, and after they after they finally after a few years and they started going through getting rid of that old blood, that old mentality that was keeping the players and the team down, then they started to improve. But it was just hard initially. It was just hard initially because I think it got to everyone because you're doing something you love. You go down the street, people are, you know, you know, just they give you a finger or, you know, stuff like that. So, and back then. Really? It just, 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So, I mean, because they they were they were fans. They 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 were fans. They were there. But some people were upset, you know, that you weren't winning, and yeah. found that you're you're a player, and they said, "We well, don't, you know, get out of here," you know. So it was it was a negative. It was just a negative attitude at that time. But I was I was happy to see when the organization, uh, the staff changed, and with the influxuation of players, influx of players, that the Buccaneers were able to win a Super Bowl. That was uh, I was so happy to see that, and just lets me know, you know, just let you know that. It just takes time, and well, we know about that. But if we start talking about New England, that's a whole other thing. But yes, right, um, yes. And your first year, you, you you were there the the last season that John McKay was the head coach. Yes. What was it like playing for yes. Coach McKay? Uh, so I said he 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 wasn't, and he was a great he was a great. I, I sat down to talk with him. But he just on the field, he he left everything up to his uh, assistant coaches. And uh, and coach was coach from Detroit. Um, uh, uh, can't think of his name. But he went and he ended up going to to, D, to uh, Detroit. He was the head coach. Um, Wayne Font. Forgot his name. Yeah, Wayne, Wayne Font. He yeah. left. He, Wayne Wayne basically took over the team. And um, we just didn't. We just whatever. We just didn't have the magic to get it done. We didn't. Uh, we played well. Everyone went out and hustled, but it just this wasn't our time, I guess. So, um, but but the team the team was close. The team was close. The players were close. Uh, that's all we had with one another. Uh, we just needed to learn and get our heads straight, which we didn't do in time to have a successful. Uh, run of things while I was there uh, to have a run at, you know, being in a playoff game or, you know, uh, something else to that, to that magnitude. So, but I learned, yeah. and like I said, I loved it. Got to meet a lot of people, got to, you know, spend a lot of time with the family um, and learn that that's the thing. Family was a, was an important thing. So. And to that end, Chris, you know another great friend of ours, and 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 that's Gay Culverhouse, who uh, introduced yes. you to us. Talk about your <laughs> yes, relationship with Gay. Yes, we met uh, we met a few years ago, and uh, I was we we sat we sat we sat around because I didn't I didn't know she was at first when she walked in, and then I we I introduced to her, and I started talking to her, and we just seemed to hit it off from that point on. Um, she's helped me with a lot of information and, and, uh, getting, uh, even more benefits than I had available to me over the years. She's helped me quite a bit with that. And, uh, we just, uh, the friendship has grown, uh, over the years. So, uh, um, just thankful that I met her and, uh, um, because I didn't know, I never got to know her father too well, being the, the owner of the team, never got to speak to him much at all, but, uh, got to speak to his daughter and she was, uh, she was a great person, great lady. So Chris, what are you doing now? Right now I'm working with them. Well, I just, I, I actually just moved to Arizona. I was in San Diego with the, uh, working with the NFL alumni helping the play, retired players uh, mainly take care, take advantage of their benefits because a lot of players just won't go, just don't or haven't on a regular basis gone out to to see what benefits they have. And uh, so we we're trying to we we're trying to change that. As I said, when I retired, that guy, uh, someone helped me, so I wanted to pass that along and do the same thing. So um, that's what I do, just working with the alumni. I haven't gotten active with the – with the chapter here, I have a few things going on. I need to take care of health-wise, and then uh, I'm going to get busy and uh, working with the NFL alumni players here in the uh, Arizona area, Scottsdale, Arizona, to be specific in that area. So, um, just take just just uh, just taking it easy now, and I'm one. Of, you know, I'm, I'm realizing every day that I'm one of the older guys now. You know, when it when it goes somewhere, and I that's it just snuck up on me again. <laughs> just not uh not ever thinking that oh, no, I'll be all right. I can do whatever. 
But, you know, it's, it's been good. Life has been good. I have no complaints. Uh, um, but like I said, I just wanted to try and reach out and uh, see what I can get involved in helping the communities out here in uh, the Arizona area. So, Chris, how can our listeners stay up to date with what you're doing? Can there, is there a way for them to follow you, whether it's online or over social media? Yeah, they can uh, uh, Washington Washington dot com at g no yeah Washington dot Thomas at gmail dot com. Uh, that's my uh, Facebook uh, hangout, and uh, they can see what's going on there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not on there as much as I used to be, but yes, that's they will see any information that's going on with me uh, and what I'm involved in will be at that website or that email so right. can get there. Well, Chris, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to come and be a part of the show. We hope you'll come back and do it again sometime. It's uh, It's been great spending some time with you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, let's get ready for that game on Sunday. Take it easy. There you go. Thank you, Chris. Take care. All right, Chris. Take All care. Right. All the best to you and your family. We look forward to catching up with you again sometime soon. Okay, thank you. Take it easy. Good night. Thanks, Chris. That is uh, former Iowa State and Bucks linebacker Chris Washington. And, uh, you know, you go back and, and look at what he achieved, you know, particularly at Iowa State, Bob, and, you know, great compliment uh, to him from Mike Stenzerud. But uh, a guy who's in the uh, Iowa State Hall of Fame, you know, career leader in tackles, you know, most tackles in a season, had an unbelievable career there and then uh, did some did some good things when he was with the Bucks. Unfortunately, it had to be awfully difficult by being a member of those Bucks teams that, you know, for, for the most part, won two or three games for a very long time. Yeah, that 6-10 and 10 rookie season he had under McKay. Chris, that was the best season <clears throat> in his regime. But uh, you're right. I mean, very interesting guy talking about his basketball career. Didn't play football till late. And uh, my goodness, what he accomplished in just such, such a short time. And like we talked about, out of football at age 28, 29, and that's the problem, Chris, for a lot of guys. And we heard it right from the horse's mouth tonight. That was uh, pretty interesting stuff. But he's giving back, and that's uh, what a lot of these guys continue to do. Great guy.